What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs. Got it. BDGE. Fantasy football. This is the first solo video I've done in a minute, man. This is the first one of uh, 2000... What year is it? 2019, baby. But you know we're constantly living in 3019 in the HQ. Your man's just hitting you with the big facts only. I hope y'all had a good year, man. I hope y'all had a good fantasy season. I want to say a sincere thank you to everyone that supported me in any kind of way whether it was just liking a video and that's the way you can support me guys if you want to just scroll down real quick like the video lets me know you appreciate it leaving a comment down below if you really want to support me you can head over to patreon.com slash bdge to where you support your favorite creators or head over to bigdogsfantasy.com and grab some one-of-a-kind merch we ain't selling this shit anywhere else just on the website baby but yeah i hope you guys had a great year a great fantasy year it was another awesome year for the brand and the business and whatnot but we're going to be doing this all offseason, man. This is what Big Dogs does. And we're going to be hitting you with the big facts, the big stats. And today we are focusing specifically, specifically on rookies. The guys who had their first years in the league. These guys were not intimidated by the man beasts that play defense among them. I would be fucking terrified if it was my first year in the NFL. Imagine being called a stud your entire life, right? Like if you're in, in the NFL, there's no doubt like through... Pee Wee and middle school and high school and then even into college, you were always a stud, right? You were always the best of the best of the best of the best. And it just continues to narrow down as you move up and get better and enter the NFL and whatnot. And that's what you have, man. As you're a rookie, it is fucking hard to adapt. These are the fastest of the fastest, the biggest of the biggest, the strongest of the strongest. Philip Lindsay said, fuck y'all vets, it's my time to eat. It is big dogs gotta eat, and there has never been a better time to be a rookie for fantasy football. And that's what we're going to get into today. So we're doing my first team all rookie, similar to the how how they have the first team all pro or first team all defense for the NBA, whatever, whatever. We're talking about rookies, guys that splash, guys that has big years in the fantasy football landscape and kind of recapping, uh, you know, the years they had and what we expect from them going forward. So let's play that music. Make sure you hit the thumbs up if you enjoy the video or if you enjoyed any of the videos that I put out throughout 2018. I love y'all. Let's do it. So rookies, man, the thing we've learned over the last couple of years is that if you are shying away or if you don't want to draft rookies just based on your analysis that it's a rookie, you are going to cost yourselves games in fantasy football, right? I'm looking at my big money league, the E-Town Get Down League. Go check out one of those videos. The winner of, of the E-Town Get Down League, the big the big money pool that, uh, that we've been doing for about 10 years now, the championship team had Saquon Barkley on it. I'm sure a lot of championship teams did. Baker Mayfield was in it in his championship starting lineup. Um, he had DJ Moore. He had Kalen Balaj on his bench. So a lot of rookies, you know, on a on a roster that doesn't really have that many players. So you can see that they're important pieces, right? Now more than ever, now more than ever, rookies are dumb important in terms of fantasy football, right? You have the fossil type coaches like Marvin Lewis who refuse to play the rookies for no other reason that they think that that's a good move, even though analytically it's a horrible move. They're getting pushed out of the NFL, right? They're slowly getting phased out of the league. And you're looking at these forward thinking coaches like Sean McVay and Sean Payton and even Bill Belichick is centering their offenses around rookies like Alvin Kamara and Cooper Cup and, and Sonny Michel and things like that. And over the last few years, we've seen just a flock of young rookies come into the league, stamp their names on top of the leaderboards, and, you know, hit the spin cycle on the fantasy landscape, just flipping that shit around 180 degrees. 2016, college football gave us Zeke, extra medium Derrick Henry and Kenyon Drake, Jordan Howard, Alex Collins, and some of the undrafted free agents representing Team Thick with two Cs, Peyton Barber, Rob Kelly, Jalen Richard. 2017 brought us an unbelievably deep rookie class of running backs, wealthy as a mother freak. Fournette, McCaffrey, Dalvin Cook, Joe Mixon, Alvin Kamara, Kareem Hunt, James Conner, Tariq Cohen, Jamal Williams, Marlon Mack, Aaron Jones, Elijah McGuire, Chris the God Carson, and a few undrafted free agents like Austin Eckler, Corey Clement, Matt Breida. These are all from 2017. It is becoming ridiculously, ridiculously full of rookies coming in and making impacts immediately. We haven't seen many wide receivers or tight ends really play themselves out um, accordingly over the last few years, 
But the tide is starting to shift the other way for receivers, especially in 2018. Tight ends still blow. I think that's going to be the case for a long time just because that's one of the hardest positions to learn and adapt to as a rookie. So I wanted to compile the all-rookie fantasy team, basically. And you know what? There are no real rules here. I'm not going to be a cunt and be like, yeah, there's only one quarterback, two running backs, two wide receiver tight end. Like, listen, there are like five running backs that I think deserve to be named on this all-rookie team. I might do one quarterback. I might do three. That's what I'm going to do. I might do two running backs. I might do five. That's what I'm going to do. I will also have an honorable mention on here. So sit back, tuck your damn shirt in, stop yelling, and enjoy the video. We're going to start off with the quarterbacks. And the first one on this list is Baker Mayfield of the Cleveland Browns. Baker Mayfield obviously was the first pick overall in the NFL draft this year. His fantasy draft position for the 2018 season, so last summer in August, being picked at quarterback 28, 217 overall. He finished as quarterback 16 in fantasy, like quarterback 18 to 19 fantasy points per game, depending on your league's settings. Now, he did not disappoint. The number one overall pick did not disappoint in his inaugural NFL season. He threw for 27 passing touchdowns in basically 13 and a half games because he entered week three halfway through the game, led a crazy game back um, in which they beat the Jets finally. And those 27 passing touchdowns passed Peyton Manning for the NFL record. Most passing touchdowns by a rookie quarterback in NFL history. Baker's going to be a top five quarterback in the league before long, especially with a lot of the older guys <coughs> being phased out, right? Within the next five years, um, Drew Brees, Tom Brady, these older guys who have been elite for so long are probably going to be out of the league. Baker had the ninth best passing grade per PFF. He had the third best deep ball accu- accuracy percentage in the NFL. He threw for 11 of his 27 touchdowns on deep passes. He had the fifth highest red zone completion percentage. Um, 12th highest in pressured completion percentage per player profiler. These are all things you look for to know if the QB is actually a good thrower, right? Baker checked all the boxes. And I'm talking about like red zone and pressured completion percentage. Like when you're getting pressure on you, when you're in the red zone, this is when the defense is super tight. And this is when you need to be a very accurate passer. And I think this is what separates good quarterbacks from great quarterbacks. And Baker fits into the latter category. Overall, Baker threw for uh 3,725 passing yards in 13 and a half games. If you pace that out to 16 games, you're looking at 4,400 passing yards. And he's an athlete too. Uh, While he didn't really rush for much this year, 131 yards on 39 carries, he scored at least five rushing touchdowns in all three seasons as the starter um, in Oklahoma for the Sooners. So I think going forward, we're not only going to see him, you know, pound the passing numbers in the box score, but we're going to get anywhere from like 200 to 300 rushing yards a year with two to four touchdowns on a yearly basis. So he's going to give you those like Aaron Rodgers type numbers where you are a prolific passer, but since you are an athlete, you're also going to be putting up good numbers on the ground. That's what I think we can expect from Baker going forward. Forward. And he might have, you know, struggled a bit production wise this year, if you want to say, compared to like, relatively speaking, just fantasy quarterbacks overall. But over the last seven games of 2018, so like the last half of this year, he threw three or more passing touchdowns in four of those seven games. He even had a four touchdown game, which you do not see a lot of rookies throw for. He scored 21 or more fantasy points in four of those last seven. He was quarterback nine in fantasy over the last seven weeks and fourth in fantasy points per drop back. He's a quarterback one in fantasy in 2018. 18 as far as I'm concerned. I don't have my rankings done yet. Uh, when I do have them done for the 2019 season, I probably will put them on Patreon. So if you subscribe to me on Patreon, you will get a lot of early access to these things. Baker Mayfield, first team all rookie fantasy football. Lamar Jackson is the next one up on this list for the Baltimore Ravens. 32nd overall, first round this year. Fantasy ADP went undrafted, obviously, because Joe Flacco was the starter entering the year. Fantasy rank, how did he finish? Uh, quarterback 29 overall weeks one through 17, obviously, because he didn't play the first eight weeks, but he was quarterback 13 in weeks 11 through 17. So once he took over as a starter, he was a top 13 fantasy quarterback with games, obviously a much, uh, much higher than that. While Baker did his thing through the air, right? This crop, this crop of rookies really saw uh, an influx of guys who were able to produce by way of the ground and putting up a lot of rushing numbers, whether it was yards or, or carries or touchdowns or whatnot. And uh, Lamar Jackson is the prime example of this class when we're talking about that. And props to the uh, to the Ravens coaching staff, really. Because when you look at it, right, a lot of guys like Lamar Jackson, people are like, eh, I don't know if I like him coming in. I don't know if he can really produce on the NFL level. All of these guys who are good athletes can produce. It is 100% a matter of whether or not your coaching staff understands how to put them in position to succeed. Lamar Jackson, prime example of that. You can put Lamar Jackson in a pro passer, spread offense type of uh, NFL offense, and he's not going to succeed. You don't 
don't want him throwing the ball 40 times a game. However, if the Ravens coaching staff bought in like they did to him running the ball 13, 15, 22 times a game, their offense is going to run a lot better. And that's exactly what we saw over the second half of the year. So props to the Ravens coaching staff for saying, we're going to take Lamar Jackson and we're going to buy all into his playing style. Stop trying to fit a fucking square piece of the puzzle into a round hole. It's not how this shit works. There's levels to this shit in coaching. So shout out Baltimore. Um, they did not force him to throw the ball a ton. In Jackson's seven starts, so he, he started seven times in the regular season. He never threw the ball more than 25 times in a single game. He had double-digit rushing attempts in every single one of those games, and he averaged 17 rushes a game over those seven games, which is fucking nuts. And I tweeted this stat out. You look at the seven games in which Lamar Jackson was the starter. Like I said, he averaged 17 rushes a game. If you take those seven games and you pace them out to a full 16-game season, Lamar Jackson is going to have 272 carries, 1,070 rushing yards, 9 rushing touchdowns, 161 fantasy points, which would make him the RB21 in standard, the RB22 in half PPR, the RB28 in full PPR. This is not including, those rankings are not including any of his passing stats, any receiving stats. Obviously, he's not going to have receiving stats, but compared to the other running backs that are in that rankings, those guys do have receiving stats. So his rushing numbers are absurd if you pace those out as the starter to a full 16-game season. Unsurprisingly, Jackson led NFL quarterbacks in carries with 147, rushing yards with 697, and was tied with Deshaun Watson with five rushing touchdowns again. He was the only he was only the Ravens quarterback for seven games. He did lose four fumbles this year, though, and I am filming this after the wild card uh, playoff game. So we saw him have huge ball security issues in that game. So that is definitely a major concern going forward. But he missed out on the last regular season game of the of the season on his third a third rushing touchdown. So he had that the week 17 he scored two rushing touchdowns. He was a yard away, got overturned from scoring a third rushing touchdown. Had he gotten in on that third rushing touchdown, he is the quarterback 7 in points per game over the last 7 weeks of the season. So that's the type of upside you're getting with Lamar Jackson as a fantasy quarterback. But either way, Jackson's worst rushing game was 13 carries for 39 yards. But he had at least 70 rushing yards in every other game and scored four times in those seven games. So by those numbers, he started you off with 10 fantasy points as a floor just from his rushing averages. And the ceiling, as we saw in week 17, was 20 carries, 90 rushing yards, two touchdowns. And that's what you love about Lamar Jackson as a fantasy quarterback. Now, his passing yardage obviously isn't there. He went over 200 passing yards just once in those seven starts. Um, but he got more efficient throwing the ball as the season went forward. He threw for four touchdowns, zero interceptions over their last five games compared to, you know, two or three interceptions in the first couple starts. Most importantly, though, he led them to a 6-1 and one record over those final seven games. Their only loss was in Kansas City against a very, very tough Chiefs team in overtime. So, Mar Jackson got better as the year progressed. Obviously, that playoff game is not sitting well for this analysis. But, guys, it was a really tough game. They're at Baltimore. I mean, they're uh, they're against the Chargers defense that played them for the second time. So teams are going to have a a better read on Lamar Jackson, but he's also going to have an entire summer to prepare as a starter for this team. So Lamar Jackson gets on this list. We have a third quarterback on this list, and that's Josh Allen, Buffalo Bills. Drafted seventh overall this year. Fantasy ADP undrafted, obviously. Quarterback 21 overall. Quarterback 11 on a fantasy points per game basis this year. Guys, he was a top 12 quarterback in fantasy. Now, while Jackson was the premier running quarterback, Allen was not far behind him, right? Allen was fourth in the NFL in rush attempts for quarterbacks, second in rushes per game, second in rushing yards, 631, and he led the NFL in touchdowns by a quarterback with eight. He scored eight fucking rushing touchdowns. Jeez, that's a lot. Allen looked awful to start the year. Before getting hurt in week six, it was something that probably wasn't that surprising, but he did return in week 12, right? He missed a bunch of games with an injury. He returned in week 12. He was the quarterback one in fantasy football from week 12 onwards. So for six games, six weeks, he was the quarterback one in football. He had rushing lines in these games of 13 for 99 yards and a touchdown, nine rushes for 135 yards, nine rushes for 101 yards and a touchdown, nine rushes for 95 yards and two touchdowns, and he scored 26 fantasy points or more in half of those six games. So including a monster 40 and a half point fantasy game in week 17. And what's crazy is that in college, like when he came out, right, Josh Allen did not have a single game in college where he rushed for 75 yards or more, not a single one. 
Over the last six games of that season for the Bills, Josh Allen rushed for 95 yards on the ground or more, 95 or more yards on the ground in four of those last six games. So zero games in which he rushed for 75 yards or more, but four games of 95 yards or more over the last six games for the Bills. So while we knew Allen could move around the pocket if he needed, like we knew he was an athlete, we did not see this type of running breakout coming from the rookie. What we did know about Allen, however, though, was that he was bad at throwing the ball. And we knew out of college that his accuracy was going to be an issue. It was going to be a problem, and it was going to be the debate of whether or not they should have used a, a, you know the seventh overall pick on him as a quarterback. First, for all you Bills fans that are about to get mad that I said he was an inaccurate quarterback, shut the fuck up. He is a horrible thrower of the ball. He is still very inaccurate. He threw 12 interceptions to 10 touchdowns. And yeah, you could say, oh, he did better than Josh Rosen. Sure, I'm not fucking putting Josh Rosen on this list. So just just get past that. He was Josh. Uh, Josh Allen, both of the Joshes were fucking terrible during the rookie year, throwing the ball. Josh Allen was dead last, 38 of 38 qualified quarterbacks in adjusted completion percentage. His PFF passing grade, passing ranking was 32nd among quarterbacks, and his football outsiders DVOA was 33rd among quarterbacks. Per Roto World, where Allen particularly struggled was on third downs, 43% completion rate, and in the red zone, 40%, which is the least surprising because, like I said with Baker Mayfield, where he succeeded in those parts of the field where it gets tight and defenses get very, 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 very tough, this is where Josh Allen struggled because it, you need to be super accurate in order to convert in the red zone under pressure on third down, things like that. So it's fine for fantasy. It is. This is a fantasy football list, so I don't care about him throwing the ball. Allen found his groove over the last six games, and he realized that running the ball was what made the most sense for this offense. Most sense for the offense, and that's what made it most effective. He led them to a 3-3 three and three record to close the year, which is much better than I would have expected because they are a team that did not have a lot of players on personnel. I mean, he obviously needed weapons. I, I'm not going to take that away from him. They had no weapons for him to work with, right? They had Robert Foster, who had like a mini breakout at the end of the year. Zay Jones was his best receiver. They got rid of Kelvin Benjamin. Sean McCoy was banged up and did not have a particularly good year. So he had arguably the worst supporting cast in 2018. His O-line wasn't great whatsoever. And he got very little help from the running game. This is a new wave of fantasy quarterbacks that we're seeing, though. These athletes who are running the ball more than ever. So Josh Allen makes his name onto this list and rounds out the list of my first team all rookie fantasy football quarterbacks. Let's move over to the wide receivers, the pass catchers. Before we do so, guys, if you are enjoying, if you found value, information, whatever, 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 if you want to support the brand, please go hit the thumbs up button down below. It lets YouTube know that y'all are enjoying this shit and it'll show it to other people. Thus, it'll bring more people to my channel and eventually help me grow and it'll make me happy and blah, 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 blah. The wide receivers, man. This is a wide receiver class that I think is going to have a really, really big impact on the NFL. NFL for a really, really, really long time. A lot of really solid players at the wide receiver position came out of this class. And I don't think a lot of the, the wide receivers here are going to develop into true number ones like that prototype, but that's fine for fantasy. Um, it's almost better considering the discount that a lot of these players, the stigma that wide receiver twos in the NFL get in terms of fantasy, because you always want the one, right? You always want the guy who's going to get the most targets, the most volume, whatever. But you look at Teams like Pittsburgh, Minnesota, Cincinnati, Atlanta, the Rams, Houston, Tampa Bay, the Chargers, Seattle, Detroit, they all basically have multiple top 30 fantasy wide receivers on their team, and I'm sure I'm forgetting a few. So being the second wide receiver on a team is not necessarily you know, a, a death stroke here. So two guys on this list, two first-team all-rookie wide receivers, fantasy wide receivers make this list. First up, of course, is your man's Calvin Ridley, Atlanta Falcons represent the dirty, dirty. 26 pick overall fantasy ADP he was drafted as a 48th wide receiver 132 overall he finished the year as wide receiver 19 in fantasy 23rd wide receiver in terms of fantasy points per game I'll be honest as a Falcons fan man I was not too happy with this pick I thought the last thing we needed was to use our first round pick on a skill player on offense we already had a bunch of those I mean I still think that was true I think we need much more help getting to the quarterback and on the defensive things, but whatever. Ridley did us Falcons fans justice with his rookie season, finished as the top 20 wide receiver right out of the gate, and that was very largely in part to his 10 receiving touchdowns on the year. Calvin Ridley is a fourth wide receiver to catch double-digit touchdowns during his rookie season over the last 20 years. Mike Evans and Odell Beckham both caught 12 in 2014 in their rookie seasons. Mike Williams of the Tampa Bay Bucks caught 11 back in 2010. His uh, 821 receiving yards, Calvin Ridley, were the 22nd lowest number for anyone that's caught 10-plus touchdowns in a season. 
over the last 20 years, which is 159 different wide receivers. His 64 catches are the 26th lowest number of catches for a double-digit touchdown rookie. Does that say regression? Maybe. Does he need to up his other stats and not depend on touchdowns? Probably, but for this year, he got the goddamn job done. Now, his overall numbers definitely looked better than fantasy owners care to admit, because if you were trying to pick weeks to start him, it was an absolute nightmare. It was really, really tough to, you know, confidently put him into your lineup. He had that crazy stretch in the beginning of the year where he caught, you know, six touchdowns in three games from weeks two to four. Um, he managed to throw up three duds in a row right after that, and he scored fewer than seven half point PPR fantasy points in eight of the 10 games following that three week breakout before finally catching a touchdown pass in each of Atlanta's final two games. So he was super inconsistent with some huge games mixed in. Now it's hard to imagine a ton of consistency given Julio Jones is on the field with you and he already commands 28% of the team's targets and NFL high 45% of the air yards on that team. Julio led the NFL in targets, so it's hard for Ridley to put up consistent production when you have someone else that is so consistent with such a high volume. But Ridley was a big play guy, and you have to like that as a fantasy owner, right? He was top 10 in the NFL in terms of receptions of 40-plus yards, and that's what you're going to get with a guy uh, with 4-4 speed coming out of college. So a solid yet inconsistent rookie year, and building on that, a solid yet inconsistent rookie year, we have DJ Moore, the second wide receiver on this list out of Carolina. Round one pick, also the first wide receiver off the board in the NFL draft this year, 24th pick. So Ridley was the 26th, Moore went a couple picks earlier than him. He was drafted in the preseason as the wide receiver 51, 140 overall in fantasy finished as wide receiver 38 wide receiver 46 in terms of fantasy points per game like I said if you choose to describe Ridley's year as like solid but inconsistent DJ Moore was pretty much a poor man's Calvin Ridley if we're going to look at that way Moore didn't play much in the beginning of the year from weeks one to seven he was playing on like 38 percent of Carolina's offensive snaps per fantasyinsiders.com great website great resource good shit there Moore uh, took over a full-time role pretty much after week eight or in week eight and thereafter and kind of never looked back. He finished as an 88% offensive snap player over their final 10 games. His target share also doubled. So weeks one to seven, he was seeing a 9% target share on the offense. Weeks eight through 17, that was all the way up to 18%. So like Ridley, you know, Moore's season was littered with big games. He had a five for 90 game, which included two rushes for 39 yards. So almost 130 yards overall, a seven for 157 in a touchdown game and eight for 91 game. But it also came with plenty of bad games. One for 16, four for 20, two for 12, two for 19. And those are games in weeks 15 and 16 when you wanted to play him and was in your fantasy uh, playoff games and could have screwed you out of some points there. My first thought Given that I was looking at the, the box score numbers, Moore was seeing eight to nine targets in every single game over the second half of the year. It was that a lot of them were probably inaccurate coming from Cam Newton, right? He tends to overthrow players, and the players that do end up seeing enough catchable targets are the ones like Funches or Kevin Benjamin who are like 6'9", and, and regardless of how inaccurate Cam is, they could always somehow get an arm on it. Moore's a smaller player, so I was like, maybe it was Cam's fault. Let me look at this. But per player profiler, Moore's catchable target rate, so the number, you know, the percentage of, of the ball thrown his way that were actually catching. 83%, 27th in the NFL among all wide receivers. So not bad. So he's someone I'm going to keep a close eye on this, this preseason or this offseason going forward. One of the things I really, really am going to key in on is Matt Harmon's reception perception where he looks over actual game film and charts players like DJ Moore to see his success rate against uh, things like man coverage, press coverage, zone coverage. So I want to see if he was beating defenders, if his production was more was more of him, his own doing, or, or was it more of the Carolina play calling, you know, getting him, making sure that he got touches and manufacturing touches for him. So that's something I'm going to keep a, a close eye on when it comes to Matt Harmon's reception perception. Now, he certainly has the chance to make a major leap in 2018 and really cement himself as Carolina's wide receiver one. Funchess was phased out of the offense by the end of the year, and he'll be a free agent this summer. There's no way they're going to re-sign him after not using him over the second half of the year. Curtis Samuel is not a wide receiver one. He's going to be a weapon in that offense. Greg Olson will be coming off another big foot surgery this offseason, so it could be just the more show, man. Just more, more in 2019. Uh, Moore's a, a very intriguing guy for me going forward. I liked what we saw from him in the rookie year, as well as a lot of these running backs we are about to speak on. Running backs, running backs, running backs. Another strong class, like I said, over the last few years, we've seen a lot of very, very, very strong classes come into the NFL, led by Baekwon, Sagad Barkley, Nick Chubb, Philip Lindsay, Sonny Michelle. 
with uh, a bunch of honorable mention guys, which I'll get to later. Saquon Barkley, of course, the New York Giants is the first all-world running back, best running back in the NFL right now, hands down, not even a question to me. Obviously, he's the best running back in this rookie list. Drafted second overall, his fantasy ADP was RB6. He was the seventh overall pick in drafts this summer, and I was telling you not to shy away from him. There was no reason to shy away from him if you've ever seen the guy play. He finished the season as the running back two overall right behind Todd Gurley. So, and his 2018 season, Saquon Barkley's, was the 15th best PPR fantasy season of all time. And that is per Scott Barrett of PFF. 15th best of all time. Looking at his final stat line, rushing numbers, 261 carries, 1,307 rushing yards, 11 touchdowns, five yards per carry. Receiving, 121 targets, 91 catches, 721 receiving yards, four touchdowns. So we're talking about over 2,000 yards from scrimmage as a rookie. 15 total touchdowns. Baquan joins Eric Dickerson and Edron James as the only rookies in NFL history to surpass 2,000 yards from scrimmage in their rookie season. My throat hurts from yelling at y'all. Goddamn, goddamn, goddamn. <clears throat> Barkley was everything for the Giants this year, man. He was a 21% target share. He led the NFL in runs of 20 plus yards. So he was getting the volume. He was making all the big plays. Um, he led the NFL in runs of 40 plus yards. He had seven of them. So almost every other game, you're getting a 40 plus yard run out of Barkley. He scored 15 of the team's 36 offensive touchdowns. So 42% of the touchdowns were from Barkley, which is unheard of because most teams have a very heavy lopsided touchdown difference coming by the way of the passing game and wide receivers and tight ends. Not the case here. And he did this behind the NFL's 19th ranked run blocking line per PFF, 29th ranked per football outsider. So just so much room for improvement on that offense for what Barkley could do. He was incredible to own in fantasy football thanks to his just his sheer consistency, right? He saw 18 plus touches in every single game but one. He caught at least five passes in half of their games, at least. So you're getting at least five catches in, in every other game. He caught nine or more passes in a quarter of their games. So in four of their 16 games, he caught nine or more passes. If you owned him in a full PPR league, this is like a ridiculous production. And it honestly would have been hard to lose your league if you owned him. He scored 24 plus PPR points in half of their games. He scored 20 plus PPR points in 12 of 16 and 17 and a half or more PPR points in 15 of 16 games. You're getting an auto 20 points from this guy if he's in your lineup. I don't need to tell you any more about Barkley. He's obviously a top three fantasy pick in every 2019 fantasy football draft, arguably the number one overall pick. Let's move on to the next running back. Now that's Philip Lindsay of the Denver Broncos. Undrafted free agent, did not get drafted in the NFL draft. Undrafted per fantasy football drafts this summer. Ended up as running back 12 in fantasy football. Legitimately an RB1 in 12 team leagues, guys. A fucking beast. Philip Lindsay is a beast. And not to mention his swag factors off the goddamn charts. Five foot eight, maybe. 185 pounds, undrafted free agent out of Colorado. Rushed for 1,037 yards, nine touchdowns under 192 carries. Added 241 yards and a score on 35 catches through the air. Lindsay became the first undrafted offensive rookie ever to make the Pro Bowl this season. And just the third undrafted rookie running back to run for more than 1,000 yards. A ridiculously good year for Lindsey considering his... What's the fucking word I'm looking for? Pedigree? Yeah, I guess pedigree. So imagine being told in the beginning of the year that there was going to be a rookie running back on the Broncos that makes the Pro Bowl, is an RB1 in fantasy. Just imagine being told that in the beginning of the year. I mean, I would have known it was Philip Lindsay. I obviously knew that. Y'all would have been like Royce Freeman, lock, guaranteed, third round pick, fourth round pick. Fuck y'all for always saying to pick Royce Freeman in the third and fourth round. That shit. Since I fade the public, I knew it was going to be Philip Lindsay, if we're going to be honest with you. But Lindsay burst onto the scene, man, and he became that guy. He became the Broncos feature back by week seven. In Lindsay's last nine games, week seven to week 16, obviously he missed week 17 with the injury, which we'll get on to in a second. He scored eight times in those last nine games, went for over 100 in total yards in four of those nine games. Football Outsiders ranked Lindsey uh, as the sixth best running back per their DVOA. Pro Football Focus gave Philip Lindsey their seventh best running back grade on the year. He was third in the NFL in terms of runs of 40 plus yards. He was making big plays happen. He was constantly getting five, eight, 12 yards despite his size, man. Third in the NFL in yards per carry behind only Aaron Jones and fellow rookie carry on. Johnston. But he was first among 33 running backs with at least 135 carries. So he was third behind Jones and Johnson, but 
among qualified backs with more carries, he was actually number one overall. He also converted five of his six goal line carries into touchdowns. A monster year for Lindsey, well deserving of all the recognition he's finally getting. Unfortunately, his uh, his season ended with a wrist injury that forced him to miss week 17. It'll be a long uh, recovery, apparently. I don't really know much about the timetable. I think it's going to be like three or four months. He should be ready to go for the summer. Um, and I'm really intrigued to see where he's going to go in drafts because... They're going to get a new head coach there, and depending on the scheme, you know, we don't know if they're going to try to force Royce Freeman into the lineup, but Philip Lindsay's just too good not to get 15-plus touches a game uh, in 2019. So Lindsay is the second running back on this list, the third running back on this list. Nick Chubb with the Cleveland Browns, obviously. Pick 35 overall in the NFL draft, second round. Fantasy ADP, running back 44, 119 overall. Finishes the year as running back 16, running back 20 fantasy points per game on the year. The constant theme, the constant theme that you'll see throughout rookie seasons is that their coaches just take too goddamn long to insert them into the lineup, get them involved, and get them involved with the with the correct volume, with the right number of touches in order for them to succeed. For Chubb, the 35th overall pick in this year's draft, it wasn't until after week six when the Browns traded Carlos Hyde. Uh, to the Jags that Chubb really took over as the horse in Cleveland, right? Nick Chubb finished the year as the single most elusive running back in the NFL per pro football focus and the second highest graded running back overall per their running back grades, only behind Melvin Gordon. He only had 16 rushing attempts over their first six weeks and came up just four rushing yards shy of 1,000 yards, despite only 16 rushing attempts. So starting in week seven, Chubb went full boner he went full boner you can't make you can't analyze chubb without making a juvenile chubb boner joke he went full chubb week seven and on baby from that point forward chubb's nfl ranks rush attempts third 176 rushing yards fourth 823 12th in yards per carry 4.7 yards after contact per attempt second in the nfl evaded tackles 36 first overall fantasy points eighth a top eight running back from week seven forward he had just two games in that span with fewer than 20 opportunities converted on five of seven goal line carries he had only nine fewer receptions than duke johnson over that span which might seem like a lot but considering duke johnson was supposed to be like the pass catching spe- specialist it really wasn't taking chubb's week seven numbers and onwards and pacing them out to over 16 games you're getting 315 touches, a little under 1,600 yards from scrimmage, and 12 and a half total touchdowns on the year. That is an RB1 type year. He is an RB1, should be drafted so in 2019 as the workhorse in Cleveland. A very much improved offense and shall continue to improve with all the personnel they have on their team. Last running back on this list, Sony Michelle. New England Patriots. I tried to leave off running backs that didn't play a certain number of games. Michelle just made the cut. He was the 31st pick in the NFL draft. Obviously, a lot of controversy around that pick because the Patriots don't use early round picks on on running backs. 31st overall, first round pick. Running back 33, 82nd overall fantasy picks. That's where his ADP was. He was a 33rd fantasy running back off the board. Ended up finishing as running back 28 in fantasy, running back 29 fantasy points per game. Now, I wish we could have gotten a healthy uh, Sonny Michel all year, but we didn't. He missed most of the summer with a knee issue, which pretty much automatically took him right off my draft board because I don't draft players that come into the year with an injury, uh, at least um, if they're not getting a ridiculously good discount in fantasy drafts. Forced him to miss week one, as well as weeks eight and nine. So he appeared in 13 games in 2018. Rookie year, 13 games. He ran for 931 rushing yards, six touchdowns on 209 carries, 4.5 yards per carry. He added almost nothing via the air. Um, 11 targets, seven catches, 50 yards. He ranked eighth per player profiler in yards created per carry. He also never once played on more than 48% of the team snaps. So, So think about that. 931 yards, six touchdowns, 209 carries, despite not playing on more than 48% of the team snaps in a single game. Overall, Michelle was very good in the games that he should have been good in. And uh, what I mean by should have been good in, we'll, we'll, we'll look at it this way, right? So he appeared in 13 games. He missed three, appeared in 13, but he was only 100% for 10 of them, right? So you have week two, his first game back from a long absence in the summer. Um, he was eased in. He only played 21% of the snaps that week. You have week seven in which he, suffer, which he suffered that second knee injury 
versus the Bears. Played on only 9% of the snaps. So he got hurt and then left for almost the entire entirety of the game. And then his first game back in Week 10, right? He, he left in Week 7, missed Week 8, Week 9, had his first game back Week 10 from that injury. They also eased him back into that. He only played on 27% of the snaps. So I wanted to discount any game in which he played on fewer than 30% of the snaps. So that's 10 games. That's a 10-game sample size. And I'm actually, something I want to do is look at um, a sample size, or I want to look at all of the significant running backs. So maybe any fantasy running back that was in the top 30 and look at any of them that suffered a multi-week injury. So we're looking at Melvin Gordon, we're looking at Todd Gurley, we're looking at Sony Michelle, any of those guys. And I want to look at the numbers in their first game back. I want to look at the snap percentage. I want to look at their number of touches, yardage, touchdowns, things like that. And I think we could set a precedent here where if you have a running back coming off a multi-week injury, it almost never is a good idea to play them. Um, but I will, I will, uh, I will do that research. I will do that study within the next week, and I'll probably tweet out my findings. So if you're not following me on Twitter, make sure you do that, Nick underscore BDGE. Um, but anyways, yeah. So we have ten games in which he was actually like a, a player, right? Ten games in which he played over thirty percent of the snaps. Now here are his splits in those ten games versus the three that he did not play in. On the left side, you have the ten games in which he was fully healthy. You have 19 touches a game. He went for over 100 yards, 100 total yards from scrimmage in five of those 10 games, and he scored six touchdowns in 10 games. If you pace those 10 games, you know the full strength games, out to 16 games, you're getting 304 touches, 1400 over 1400 yards from scrimmage, and just around 10 total touchdowns. His complete lack of involvement in the passing game absolutely terrif- terrifies me for next year, and has me thinking that if he moves up very far in drafts, he is going to end up being the Jordan Howard of 2019. And this is something that. I will touch on one of the next videos I'm going to do is the biggest takeaways and the biggest lessons learned from the 2018 fantasy football season. I think this might be my most helpful video I've ever put out on my channel, to be honest with you. Um, It's from a theory and and strategy standpoint, not so much like the numbers of certain players, but things I could take away from this season that are going to help you guys prepare for next season. And uh, one of them is to really just stay away from guys who are not involved in the passing game, uh, especially earlier on in drafts. And I'm I'm, I'm a little nervous that Sonny Michel is going to be that guy next year. But if he's completely healthy coming into next year, the Pats should look to ride him like they did in the 10 games that he was healthy in during his rookie season. So a lot to like from Michel, but a little bit to be scared of as well. That's the last running back on this list. Uh, I want to move over to tight ends. A very, very, very short list. There was one guy on this list, and he might actually surprise you. It's Chris Herndon of the New York Jets. NFL draft, fourth round, 107th overall pick, an undrafted free agent in fantasy football drafts, of course. Finished as the tight end 15 in fantasy football. And I'll be honest, I had fucking zero idea who this guy was until halfway through the season when he started making noise. He was a fourth round pick for the New York Jets in the NFL draft. He's out of Miami. And that was a year after we saw the Canes obviously produce David Njoku, the stud from um, on, the, on the Cleveland Browns currently. Herndon quietly put together a very strong rookie year. He caught 39 passes for 502 yards and four touchdowns. Listen to this. His 502 receiving yards during his rookie year were the 12th most among, among a rookie tight end over the last 20 years. And I guess you have to include Mark Andrews maybe on this list too then because he actually had 552 uh, receiving yards, which would be the seventh most among any rookies over the last 20 years. So they were pretty close in terms of production. Mark Andrews is a guy I'm definitely high on dynasty and someone that could emerge as the the pass catching tight end because we saw him do it with Flacco and we also saw him do it with Lamar Jackson, which was not the case for almost any other pass catcher. But 12th most receiving yards for a rookie tight end over the last 20 years for Chris Herndon. So starting in week six through the end of the regular season, which was 11 games, Herndon posted double digit PPR fantasy points in five of those 11 games. And he had eight or more <coughs> uh, PPR fantasy points in seven of 11 games. And I know this is fucking reach here. I'm like Space Jam, Michael Jordan trying to dunk the ball at the end, kind of reaching here. But in this tight end landscape, man, this was a tough year. And Herndon makes a list just by, you know, by a thread, just by default kind of here. So Herndon is the one guy that I like. Uh, Dallas Gutter would have been on here, but, he, you know, he's not going to get the opportunity until something happens, whether he gets moved to a different team or Zach Ertz get moved or hurt or whatever. Uh, Mike Kosicki, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to get there. Super athlete, super tight end. That whole Miami offense is just a mess. So obviously he didn't make the list. Now I have a couple honorable mentions here. And I did not include them on the actual list because most of them played in fewer than 12 or 10 games or whatever. 
Um, we have Dante Pettis, first of all, wide receiver for the 49ers. In the nine games he appeared in, he was the wide receiver 33 in fantasy football. So he has a very bright future. I like Pettis a lot. They traded up. Kyle Shanahan traded up to get him into the second round. He looked really good over the second half of the year. Cortland Sutton, he kind of sucked this year, to be honest with you, but he put up like decent numbers for a rookie wide receiver. So um, a whole offseason to, you know, gain chemistry with whoever is a the quarterback there. That's that's the other problem is we have no idea who the quarterback or the head coach is going to be in Denver. But he should be the wide receiver one there, the the you know the prototypical wide receiver one on the outside. So the volume should be there. Carry on Johnson, the running back for the Lions. Had he not gotten hurt, he would have easily been on this list. Um, however, he didn't do enough for me. As a Carrion Johnson owner, if you're a fantasy owner of Carrion Johnson, you understand why he didn't make this list because there was a lot of hype and then you were like, oh, when can I play him? When can I put him in my lineup? When can I finally let him do his thing? By the time that happened, he had like two really big games and you started getting really comfortable and getting excited about putting in your lineup and then he got hurt and then he pretty much missed the entire like, I don't know if it was a whole second half of the year or like six or seven games or whatever. He didn't do enough outside of like two or three big games to put him on this list. He is an honorable mention guy who I think has monster, monster upside. Could be a top 12, top 10 fantasy running back next year easily, depending on what happens in the offseason. Last guy on this list, Gus Edwards needs to be mentioned as an honorable mention guy. Didn't take over until later in the season, but just saw tons of volume on the ground um, over the second half of the year. A bunch of 100-yard from scrimmage games. Didn't score a lot. It was not involved in the receiving game, but just the fact that he was an undrafted free agent and uh, and really turned on the second of the second half of the year, took over the starting job from Alex Collins. Gus Edwards, <coughs> bam, my throat's killing me right now. I need some water, water, water. Gus Edwards deserves to be named here. So Gus, shout out Baltimore has two guys on this list. Shout out Cleveland, y'all got two guys on this list. Um, anyone else have two guys on this list? I don't, I don't think so. Nah, that is owl. So. Uh, good setup for those guys. But again, guys, do not shy away from rookies, man. They are the real deal for the most part. Um, as this offseason progresses, of course, I will be covering the rookies, the NFL draft. I think me and my E-Town Get Down mate, Snacks and Animal, will actually be attending the NFL draft this year. So it's in Tennessee. It's in Nashville. If any of y'all want to meet up, if any of y'all want to buy tickets and head to Nashville, it'll be a sick fucking weekend. Let me know. I will, uh, if enough people want to do that, I will I will organize something for the subscribers here at Big Dogs. I'll be happy to do that. Plus, you can come and meet me and Snacks and Animal. I probably wouldn't want to do that if I were one of you guys. But if you do, you can fall into that category. So I will be covering rookies. I will be covering a ton of stuff throughout this offseason. Drop a comment down below. Let me know what kind of content you want to see me um, covering throughout the offseason. And I will do my best to adjust to what the market wants, baby. Because it's all about what the market wants, man. That's it. That's going to wrap up the video. If you found this um, valuable, entertaining. If you you know, if you know, like the video, if you fuck with the brand, just give me a thumbs up. Drop a comment down below. If you're on the podcast, a rating and review is very much appreciated. I love y'all. And let's fucking murder 2019, baby. Peace.